We were glad to record this lecture by David Brousseau, which he presented at a training on how Christians can have better spiritual conversations with Muslims. Before we get started, we'd like to provide a little context for a few things he says in this lecture. Firstly, he uses the term orthodoxy, which can sometimes refer to the Eastern Orthodox Church. But generally, unless he says otherwise, he's probably referring to orthodoxy in the sense of Christianity rightly understood, which would include the church in both the East and the West. Secondly, while David does critique the Western understanding of the Trinity, we think it best to acknowledge that there have been many in the West that have properly articulated and understood the relationship between the three members of the Trinity, though we are thankful for the imagery from the East that helps us better visualize this hard-to-understand doctrine. If you would like the PowerPoint that David uses in this lecture, you can find it linked as a PDF down in the description below. The Trinity, you probably are guessing you already know what it, it teaches and, and, and that. So you'll probably be hearing some different things tonight. And this isn't coming from me. Uh, none of this is, not a drop of it is original. So originally this presentation would have been an explanation of what the early Christians believed about the Trinity. The, the Christians like within the first hundred years after the apostles, and I had to work through this. I grew up a Jehovah's Witness, and so the Trinity is a big stumbling block for, the, for them. So I can relate to the Muslims in this regard and how much the uh, early Christian understanding really helped me to, to grasp the, the Trinity. And um, our church uh, back in Texas years ago, when, when Deborah and I uh, this was maybe uh, just a few years after we left Jehovah's Witnesses that um, our church was reaching out to Muslims in our area there. And in our uh, experience of witnessing to them, yeah, the Trinity was, uh, was really hard. And I had not yet read the early Christian writings. This was just in an evangelical church. And so I, I couldn't answer their questions. You know, it, they uh, you know, objected, it's a totally confusing doctrine. And I had trouble disagreeing with that because none of us could really explain it. Um, you know, they were saying, well, there's three gods. Well, we knew that wasn't true. No, there's only one God, but we couldn't, we couldn't really explain it very well to them. You know, they'd say, well, Allah is one, you know, and you're saying there's three gods. No, no, there's, there's only one God for Christians. But okay, then explain that how this works. Well, it's a mystery, you know. And then they felt like, well, it diminishes Allah because, you know, he's not supreme. There's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And um, so, anyway, I wish I could have that conversation again. Now, I'm going to be sharing tonight from the perspective that Allah, in worshiping Allah, Muslims are attempting to worship the God of Abraham, uh, but with considerable misunderstanding. So I'm going to be thinking of Allah as uh, the Father, the God of the Old Testament. And uh, I'm not qualified necessarily to even discuss that subject. But I'm just saying this at the outset so you know where I'm coming from in my explanation. It doesn't matter. The Trinity is what it is regardless of your view of, of Allah. But anyway, that's my perspective. And I think perhaps most of you here. In other words, I'm taking the view that Muslims are trying to worship the Father, and that's what I believe about Orthodox Jews as well. Um, they just, Orthodox Jews maybe have a little better understanding and more accurate than, than the Muslims do, but neither one of them, of course, grasp or understand the Trinity. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the wrong explanations that Christians give about the Trinity, the ones that were always given to me as a Jehovah's Witness, the ones that our church gave and that um, didn't make a lot of sense to Muslims. I mean, you could understand the illustrations, but it didn't, it didn't explain how this works. So one of them, the one I heard a lot as a Jehovah's Witness is the Trinity is like an egg. How many of you heard that before? Wow, every hand just about. Okay, well, that's still, it was around when I was a little boy. I guess it's still around. Okay, so yeah, the explanation is, well, it's like an egg. You have the yolk, you have the white, and you have the shell. See, it's three, but there's just one egg, you know. Well, 
Yeah, but um, well, we'll see why this isn't orthodox in, in, in a minute. Apple, have any of you heard that illustration? Not as common, okay. So uh, that was another one I, I heard a lot. It's the Trinity is like an apple. You have the, uh, the stem, you have the skin, and then you have the, the meat in, inside, the fruit, white, the white of it uh, inside. Don't take these notes down. This is the wrong way, okay? So <laughs> I don't want you to go home and say, yeah, the Trinity is like an egg or it's like... <laughs> Another wrong one, okay? Um, actually, St. Patrick did not use the shamrock as an illustration of the Trinity. That's a myth, but that's one you hear a lot, okay? You see, it's, you know, this is the Trinity. It's, you've got, you know, like a three-leaf clover or shamrock. Okay, so those are all explanations that are dead wrong. Most Christians don't realize that. They're not trying to explain it incorrectly. But most Western Christians do not understand the Trinity. Now, the things we'll be sharing today are not only what the early Christians believed about the Trinity, but it's what Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, almost all your Eastern churches believe. So if you're going to Eastern lands, you'll be dealing with Christians there. They would be familiar with the things I'm going to be sharing tonight. It's Western Christians who got it wrong and, and have been explaining it wrong. Okay, so what the Nicene Creed says about God. Uh, have all of you heard of the Nicene Creed? If you haven't, don't raise your hand. I mean, don't... Oh, wow. Okay, you've heard the egg, but you haven't heard the Nicene Creed. That's interesting. Okay, so I'm glad I asked the question. So the Nicene Creed is the standard Orthodox uh, explanation or statement, I should say, of the Trinity. Um, almost all Western Christians would say they believe it. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that since uh, obviously a lot of Western Christians haven't even heard of it. But... Uh, it's generally, at least in textbooks and that, it would say, yeah, this is what, you know, all Christians believe about the Trinity. Um, it was in the year 325 at the Council of Nicaea, and this was the definition that they gave. Okay, it starts off, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And that's the same way the Apostles' Creed starts off. How many of you have heard of the Apostles' Creed? Okay, good. Okay. All right. So um, that's the original creed of the early Christians is the Apostles' Creed. So I'm glad you've heard of that. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the important one. So the, uh, the Nicene Creed was a more uh, elaborate explanation um, of it. And it says this, it starts off, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. And then it says, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of His Father, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of the same substance as the Father. Okay, so that's the orthodox statement of the Trinity. Does that make, are you able, to, does that make any sense to you? Is that non-intelligible or is that... Is that understandable? It's not a trick question. I'm just curious. How many think you understand what that's trying to say? Okay, it's fine if you don't. I mean, you, you know, it's it's a bit. It, it, I don't know if I would have understood it when I first read it. You know, I, I get it now, and we'll be and by the end of tonight. You'll understand this what it's what it's saying. Okay. Okay, so it says, Jesus is God from God and light from light. And it sounds, see, in English, this was written in Greek. And in English, this doesn't translate well. And it's, 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 um, it, it does sound like you're, you're double talk or something like that, okay? Okay, here the creed is using the word God in a descriptive sense, not as a proper name. When it says Jesus is God from God, which sounds like, Okay, that doesn't make sense. It's using the word God to describe his nature. It's the equivalent of saying human from human, okay? Uh, see, in English, you don't, you, the word God is normally just a proper name, you know, God, he, the person. But in Greek, theos, the word for God 
it, it could be the name of a person, but for most Greeks, they didn't believe in just one God. So it, it was like saying human. In other words, is he human or is he God? Okay, that, that God was meant divine, uh, divinity, that, that you're, you're something more than human, okay? Or it's like when Adam said uh, about Eve, this is at last flesh of my flesh, okay? Okay, somebody of the same substance or nature that, that he was. Okay, so Jesus is God from God. In other words, he came from the Father. He is of same nature as the Father. Um, like my son would be man, human from human or man from man. Okay, he's God from, from, from God, okay? But if Jesus is eternal, how can he be a son? Or if he was begotten, how can he be eternal? And that was always my question, okay? If he's eternal, how can he be a son? And I would ask so many people this, you know, after leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was like, yeah, they couldn't answer. Well, in what sense is he a son? They couldn't answer, but he is the son, you know? Well, how? And then when I was reading the early Christians, of course, they explained all this, and this is where we're going to start now. Okay, so they use the illustration of the sun in the sky, in the heavens, all right? So think of it, just think of this picture. Hebrews 1.3 says, And he, Christ, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his, his meaning the Father, nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Okay, so back looking at that picture again, okay? So they understood the Father to be the nucleus of the Son. And Hebrews says this, that the Son of God, Jesus, is the radiance. So do you see the radiance that comes out from the, the center of the Son? So that's Jesus. He's the radiance that comes out from the Father. The Father is the, the mass of the Son itself, okay? So the Son is begotten, he's not made, and he's begotten in eternity. So let's, let's think how that's possible, okay? So he's begotten, in other words, the radiance or the light that comes from the sun, it's begotten. It doesn't come of itself. It has an origin. That origin is in the sun. The light is begotten from the sun. Everyone, everyone understand that, okay? The light doesn't just start nowhere. It, it originates in the sun. It's, you could say it's begotten from the sun, all right? Now, we know the sun isn't eternal, but let's imagine that the sun up there in the heavens, that it is eternal. Imagine, imagine it has always existed. Okay, if it's always existed, what about the light that comes from it? The light would always exist too. You, you see, because... It's coexistent. In other words, as it, the minute God created the sun, you immediately had light instantaneously. The, the, and so the Father is eternal. He has always been here. So the radiance from Him is eternal as well. In other words, as long as the Father's been here, then that radiance, the Son, you know, Jesus, is eternal as well. But Jesus is begotten. He, he, he is like the light from the sun. His origin is in the Father. If you don't have the Father, you can't have the Son. You can't have Jesus Christ because, you know, his origin is in the Father. He doesn't exist of himself. He exists in the Father. D does that make sense? Okay. It, it's not, yeah, it was, it was so simple. I thought, wow, why have I never heard this? I've only heard the apple and the egg and it's like, yeah, which didn't explain anything. Yeah, this, this made sense. And then we're not going to talk very much about the Holy Spirit, but sometimes they'd say the Holy Spirit is like the heat that comes from the sun. The same, same principle is if the sun is eternal, then the heat that comes from it is eternal as, as well. Okay. So that's why you can be begotten and yet be eternal at the same time. Now here's another illustration that some people find uh, uh, easier to grasp, and, and both of them. So the other illustration they would use is that the Father is like a spring of water that, that bubbles up, okay? Jesus, 
the Son of God is like a river coming out of that spring, okay, out of that pool, all right? So let me ask you the same question. If that spring, that pool of water has always existed, then what about the river? The river's always existed. You, you see, it's co-eternal. In other words, but the river doesn't exist by itself. It, it's dependent on the spring of water that comes up. But if that spring has always been there, which the Father has always been there, then the river running off of it has always been there at the same time, okay? So that's why we can have a son of God, and yet he's eternal at the same time. Now, is there any difference between the nature of the water in that spring and the nature of the water in the river? N not a trick question. No, it's the same thing. It's the same water. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. So we say Jesus has the same nature or substance as the Father. He's, he's not different. It, it's the same life. It's the same divinity that flows out of the Father in, into the Son. So he doesn't have a different divinity. He's not like a sub divinity or, or that. He has the exact same nature as the Father, just like that river would have the exact same nature as the spring. Okay, so the Father, and see, this is where most Western Christians, they don't, they don't understand. The Father is the source of the Trinity. They basically have a Trinity without a source that, yeah, it's just, all, it's always been there. Well, you don't really have, you have names, Father and Son, but you don't really have a father and you don't really have a son. But see, in the Orthodox, the correct understanding of the Trinity, yeah, you, you have a real father and you have a real son. The father is the father because he's the source of it. The, the life of the Holy Spirit and the son come from the father. Their being, their existence is in the father. Okay. Have any of you heard any of this before? Is this new to you? Raise your hand if it's new. Okay. Yeah, most Western Christians, I mean, like I say, you know, when I, I went and explained it to my pastor, it's like, oh, it's fascinating. I'd never heard that before. And he got into seminary and everything. Well, I mean, it wasn't his fault. I mean, like I say, this, this got lost in the West because of, again, all of this was originally written in Greek and it didn't translate well into Latin and, and it, yeah, it got misunderstood. Okay. Um, now, Back to this, this illustration of the spring and the, the river, okay? Now, if that spring dried up, what would happen to the river? It would dry up. Very good. Okay. So, you see, the river is, ex is dependent on the spring for its existence, okay? If, if the Father would ever cease to exist, which is impossible the Son and the Holy Spirit would cease to exist as well because their life comes from the Father. They're not self-existence. They're not unbegotten. The Father is unbegotten, okay? Now, what would happen if somebody dammed up the river so that it, you know, went off and, and dried up? What would happen to the spring? Would it still be alive? Yeah. yeah, it would still be alive. It, it wouldn't. See, so, and, and all of this is impossible, but if Jesus and the Holy Spirit were to somehow cease to exist, the Father would still exist. He does not depend on them for His existence. They depend on, on Him for their existence. So, okay, do, do, do you see that? So, yeah, the spring is eternal. It's the source of everything. Uh, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit depend on their life from, from the Father. And that's why, again, why he's called the son, because, yeah, he does, he's not self-existent. The father is, okay? But all of this is an eternity. As I said, if that spring is eternal, then so is the river. So it's not like there's a difference in time or anything like that. Uh, if one's eternal, then they're all eternal, but they're, they're dependent on him, okay? So does the Trinity diminish Allah? Or does it make him greater? If you think of Allah as the Father, okay, if you think of the Trinity in, in the Orthodox, you know, original teaching, does that make the Father less? Does that make Allah less? Or does it make him greater? Well, in the Muslim view, 
This would be Allah, just the spring. There, there's no river or anything like that. This is the Christian view, all right? So which one is greater? Just, just being a, a, a pool by yourself or a pool that produces a river? Well, I would think a pool producing a river is a lot greater. I mean, see, it's not taking away from Allah to have the sun. It's making him greater that, wow, he's not, only, he's not, just, a, he's not just a pool. Yeah, he's a pool that has given birth existence to a, a whole river that ultimately flows down to us here on here on the earth okay so we're not diminishing Allah when we teach the Trinity as as Christians we're making Allah greater than the the Muslim concept of God would be does that make sense to you I don't know that that makes sense to a Muslim that's the that's the important question but um, hopefully it, it should okay all right and I'll ask the same question. Okay, this is the Muslim view of Allah. Okay, let's say the sun in the sky. I don't know if they use that illustration, but if they did, this would be the Muslim Allah. Okay, here's the Christian Allah. Okay, the Muslim one, the Christian one. Which one do you think is greater? Christian. Yeah, the Christian. I mean, yeah, wouldn't you? I mean, wow. I mean, you know, I mean, this is still great. But look at this. This is a sun that produces, you know, wow, you know, light and beams and heat and air, everything coming out from it. And see, this is a father. He is so beyond comprehension that, yeah, he can't exist by himself, that he's, you know, produced the sun, the Holy Spirit, all, all of these magnificent things. This is the father, you know, of the Bible. This is the, the Allah that we're bringing to the Muslims. He, so we're not taking away from him when we say, well, there's also a son and a Holy Spirit. It doesn't make him any less, you know, any more than all of the sun flares and all that make the sun less. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it makes it that much greater. So that's the exciting part of it. You know, when we, when we share the Trinity with, with uh, the Muslims that, yeah, we're not diminishing the father Allah in, in any way. Uh, we're we're realizing he's even greater than what any of us thought or would that they might imagine but you know muslims rarely hear any of this they usually hear um uh yeah explanations like the egg or something that don't make any sense and the problem with most western explanations of the trinity is that in no sense is the son begotten in fact in no sense is he really a son he's just those are names father son holy spirit but they're, they're essentially three brothers. Um, you know, you, you give different names to them, but it's not like Jesus came from the Father. It, most Western Christians, you know, like I say, after I left Jehovah's Witnesses, I spent years asking people, explain how he is a son. Can't explain it, but he's the son. Yeah, but it means he had to come from the Father. Yeah, I can't explain it. It's a mystery, you, you know. But it is interesting, you know, the, the early Christians, they, they nearly all um, use that same illustration of, of the sun in the sky. And it's interesting, um, in the Orthodox churches, they use that today. And I visited a Coptic church, uh, I don't know, probably 30 years ago. And uh, I uh, asked the bishop after church, you know, I went up to talk to the bishop to, under, you know, ask them some questions, what they believe and all that. So I told him, you know, about the illustration of the sun, and he said, yeah, that's exactly what we teach. You know, it's still, like I say, it's still what Eastern Christians are teaching. So maybe, yeah, maybe God had that in mind rather than the shamrock to explain to us the, uh, the Trinity and, and how that works. See, this is, if you Google Trinity or, you know, a picture of the Trinity, Google images or something like that, You'll see this all over. I mean, th this this exact picture or something like it. A triangle. See, this is a trinity. Well, no, I'm sorry. That is not an orthodox explanation of the trinity. What's Where's the source? In, in what sense is one of those corners, the sun, uh, begotten? Uh, wh where does any of that exist? This is just a triangle. The other thing is, as I mentioned, if you took away the, the son and the Holy Spirit, the father would still exist. He doesn't depend on them. In a triangle, if you took away the Son and the Holy Spirit, yeah, the whole triangle would collapse. It would, there would be no more God. But see, God, the Father, is always there, whether Jesus and the Son 
uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were not. Again, we're talking theoretical because Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, yeah, will always, always be here. So we're just talking in theory to help us understand the concepts, you, you know. Okay. A big reason for the confusion among Western Christians, why this didn't happen with Greek Christians, because they were reading it in Greek, it isn't helped by most of the English Bible translations, and actually this goes back to the Latin translations too. Of course, when we're dealing with English, the translators themselves usually have a wrong concept of the Trinity, and so they translate several key verses either incorrectly or inartfully, I can put it that way. In other words, they translate a lot of verses in a way that are going to confuse the reader um, that in Greek you wouldn't have the same level of confusion. So one of them is John 1.1. 1, 1. We're all familiar with this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, we've, we've all heard that verse, I'm sure, hundreds of, of times. And when you look at it, I mean, you can say it, but does that make sense? He was with God and he was God. It, it sounds like you're double talk, doing double talk. You know, he's with God, but he is God. How can he be with God if he is God? Okay. Um, when many Christians say that Jesus is God, and that's perfectly orthodox to say Jesus is God. But so many Christians, when they say Jesus is God, they mean he's the same person as the Father, which is not correct. They are two distinct and different people. And I gave this message <laughs> in uh, Holmes County, Ohio, at, at a, a Beach Amish church. I was giving a message on Jehovah's Witnesses trying to explain their errors um, and where they're wrong in their understanding of Jesus and, and the Trinity. So I was explaining all this stuff. We had a Pentecostal woman who was attending that day, uh, and the Pentecostals, the United Pentecostals, they don't believe in the Trinity. They believe there's just the Father and that He is the Son and that He is the Holy Spirit. There's just, you know, three manifestations of one being, okay? Um, and so I was trying to explain all this. There's, they are three persons, and, and she kept interrupting, you know, unlike a good Mennonite young lady, you know, no, they're not three people. They're three manifestations, you know, and it's like, so, and, and it wasn't a Q and A. I was trying to <laughs> give a message, and yeah, I never got finished because, uh, you know, she just kept interrupting and arguing the whole, whole evening. But that's, yeah, so many Western Christians have, have it so confused. They don't understand what they mean when they say Jesus is, is God. Now, in John 1.1, 1, 1, what the Greek literally says, if you're just looking at the Greek, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and the Word was God. So in the Greek, there's a little distinction there when it says the Word was with the God, and the Word was God. So what John is trying to communicate is that the Word, that's Jesus, of course, that He was with the Father, and He puts the the in there, which in Greek is the word ha, H-O, and then the word was God. He doesn't put it in the second phrase. And so what He's trying to get across is that Jesus, see, in, in Greek you can say this, that Jesus is theos. He's God. His nature is God. We don't use the word God in English that way. When we say God, we think of a person, the deity in heaven. We don't, we don't think of it as a, we talk about somebody's nature. Now, boy, there's one or two English translations that say, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was divine, which may, maybe is not quite as literal, but it's, it conveys accurately what it's saying. What John is trying to get across to his readers that, Jesus was with the Father, and Jesus was divine. He is the same nature. His nature is theos, the same as the Father's nature. Just like that water that we use. The, the water in the river is the same substance, the same nature as the water in the, in the uh, spring. There's, there's no difference between the two. Okay? Does that make sense? You're still with me? Okay. 
Jesus has the same nature. He's not human. He's not an angel. He is fully divine. He is true God in the sense of his nature or substance. So here we're using God as a descriptive noun, as describing the nature of, of a, a being, okay? And that's what we mean when we say Jesus is God, that he has the nature of the Father, okay? We don't mean he is the Father. All right. Okay, now we're going to talk about the love of the Father. Now, another aspect to share with, with Muslims and that we all know about the love of the Father, but how this ties into the Trinity and is something I would have never thought of, you know, when I was a, a young person. We all know 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Okay, now let me ask you about that, just that. God is love. How does that tie into the Trinity? When we say God is love, we don't mean that sometimes he loves or that he's a loving God. Muslims would believe that Allah is a loving God. They would teach that. But the Quran does not say Allah is love. But our Bible says God is love. That means it's in his nature from the beginning, which for him means eternity, okay? Now, can you love if you are the only person in the universe? There was nobody else in, in existence. Could you love? I mean, you might have a sweet disposition. But how could you love when there's not anyone else around? See, even if the Bible didn't tell us about the eternal son, we would have to deduce his existence from that statement, God is love. In other words, if he is love, if that's his essence, that means he's always had somebody to love because love can't exist by itself. It can't exist in a vacuum. It has to have a recipient. You can't just say, oh yeah, I, I love, uh, and you don't put anyone, you don't you know, finish the sentence, oh, I just love. Well, who do you love? Oh, no one, but just, I just love, you know? No, that, that's not love. I mean, love, there's somebody you love, you know, or it can be something, um, but it can't exist by itself. So if God is love, that tells us there has always been somebody that he loves. Love is an essential part of God's being. He didn't become love at some point in time. He has always been love. If God has always been love, then God has always had someone to love. Okay? See, why we have to have the Trinity, or not necessarily the Trinity, but at least the Father and the Son. There has to be somebody that he has always loved. And that person is the son. Now, Muslims, as I said, Muslims will say Allah is loving, but not Allah is love. Yeah, in Muslim theology, Allah has not always been a God of love because he hasn't always had someone with him to love. They would say Allah is eternal. Well, then has he always loved? No, because in their view of the universe, yeah, Allah existed from eternity, and it was who knows how many, you know, trillion, billion, you know, uh, years afterwards that then you get angels or other things in existence that he could love. But see, in our God of the Bible, he is love because he's always had from eternity someone to love. So the Trinity makes all of the Father greater because it reveals that he is always loved. He is love. See, it's, it's a lot greater God, a God who is love versus a God who is loving. You want a God who is loving, but a God who is love, that's a, at a much higher level that always, as long as there's been a father, which is forever. I mean, you can't, you know, you try to think back of eternity. I used to try it when I was a kid. I, I don't try it anymore because I know it just, it gets, it gets crazy when you start thinking of forever and, and and there's no you know it's always 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 yeah no beginning there but yeah the father means yeah it's that's always been love all that time it's always been love because he's always had his son with him to love okay another reason why the trinity has not been properly explained to muslims is western theologians confuse nature and order okay so in your family, okay? 
You and your father, whoever you are, are of the exact same nature. Okay, are you equal in order? No. I mean, does your dad do what you, you tell him or do you do what he tells you? I hope it's the other, I hope it's the second one. So he's your head, okay? So there's a difference in order. You're equal in nature, you're equally human, but there's a difference in order uh, that your father is your head, that as Jesus said, I came to do my father's will. I didn't come on my own, my father sent me. He makes it very clear that there's an order there. Okay, so Jesus and the father are equal in nature, but they're different in order, okay? that the Father is the head of Christ. The Bible you know, tells us that very clearly, and Jesus made that very clear while he was here on the earth, that his Father was his head. But that doesn't make him a lesser deity than the Father, any more than you are a lesser human being than your Father here on, on the earth. You are equally human, but there is an order there, a headship, okay? there's a headship within the Trinity. The Father is the head of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. I mean, it, it, it's so simple. It's amazing that Western Christians can read that and then turn right around and deny it, you know, that no, the Father's not his head. Well, it's right there. And sometimes I say, oh, well, that was just when he was on earth, when he was a man. No, this is Paul writing long after Jesus had returned to heaven, you know, and he didn't say he was the head. He said he is the head. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very clear. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things and he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone for I always do the things that please him. Doesn't say the Father always does, does the things that please Jesus. Not again that there's a difference in, you know, that they struggle or, you know, fight with each other or anything like that. But Jesus himself wanted us to understand. He wanted to give that glory to his Father. And it's, I mean, he repeats it all throughout John. You see the same kind of statement over and over again. He wants us to respect the Father as his head, and he doesn't resent having a head in any way. For I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak, okay? So there's a difference in order, in, in headship there. Je I mean, Jesus made this very clear. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 8, for us, us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we, we live. So he's trying to show the Father is the ultimate source of whom, and everything is through Jesus Christ. That the Father is the ultimate creator, but everything was actually created by the Son. Um, the Father used the Son to do the creating. And then Paul tells us at the end, now when all things are made subject to him, that's the, Jesus, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So he tells us even in eternity that the Father has set up Jesus as the king of his kingdom. But in the end, the Son will turn all of that over to the Father and will be subject to him. Not that he's not subject now, but uh, that he will not continue to serve as king. And some people think some Bibles even translate this in a way that makes it sound like it's talking about Jesus, which the early Christians would have been scandalized, talking about the Father who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Now, when it says that he alone has immortality, it doesn't mean that Jesus is not immortal. But here, why it says that is because existence originates in the Father. He is the only person in the universe who is self-existence. 
is self-existent. He depends on nothing else for his life. And that's why he says, who alone has immortality. Jesus, of course, is immortal in the sense that he's everlasting, but he's not immortal in the sense that he's unbegotten because his life uh, depends on the Father. Okay. In fact, when the scriptures refer to God, they're nearly always referring to the Father. It's correct to refer to Jesus as God. I mean, you know, that title is given in the scripture. But normally when you see the word God in scripture, it's talking about the Father, I would say about 98% of the, of the time. We're talking now about headship. Now, this is the interesting thing, okay? And this is why, you know, if Muslims think that, okay, the existence of Jesus takes away from God, from the Father, what they don't understand is that God wants people to honor Jesus. See, it's not like there's a rivalry there. So if Jesus wants, he wants us to glorify his Father, he's always giving credit and glory to his Father. Well, guess what? The Father wants us to honor and worship him just like we worship the Father. He, he's not an insecure God. He's eternally secure. He's the self-existent one. And he loves his son so much, he wants people to honor his son. And he's not jealous as, oh, if we give the son uh, honor. The father, Jesus said, the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. So this is a neat thing in their relationship that most humans aren't that secure, you know. But here the father... Yeah, he, because love is his very being, that he doesn't want to hog all glory for himself, or it wouldn't be hogging. He would have every right to, but it's just not his nature. He wants to share that, just like he wants to, he wants to love. He, he wants his, his son to get all of this worship and glory and honor from us. And, and that's, that is his will. So, I mean, it's, it's it. It set such an example for all of us of, of how we should be of wanting other people to share honor. If we're in a position of honor that instead of being jealous, we don't want somebody else to get credit that, hey, we want other people to get credit and honor as well. Hebrews 1, 6. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. This is the father saying this. He wants the angels to worship his son. And I've been talking about the Son, but the Holy Spirit, all these things would be true as well, that, you know, His existence is from the Father. He's eternal as, as well as the, uh, the Son is, okay? So if you're witnessing to a Muslim, hopefully you can help him or her to see that embracing the Trinity does not diminish Allah in some way, that, you know, guess what? Allah is far greater than you ever imagined. Yeah, let me tell you about what the Bible reveals about, about Allah. Thanks for listening to this episode with David Brousseau. A few times throughout this lecture, he mentions how he was once a Jehovah's Witness, and we interviewed him about that and why he left. You can find that episode linked in the show notes down below. We also have an email newsletter that you can sign up for on our website at anabaptistperspectives.org. If you enjoy what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe and leave a rating on wherever your favorite podcasting app is. It really does help. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you in the next next episode.